Good afternoon, everybody. I believe I'm audible now. So uh, basically, sorry for this technical hiccup. And uh, I intended to start after some with my dear friend and when he started on this initiation of insulin. And I'll take over from where he has left. I'll move on to what is known as the continued insulin care. That is what happens when the patient needs to be on a long-term insulin. Because we all know that diabetes is basically essentially a disease of, uh, of chronicity. And a patient once initiated on insulin, <clears throat> most of the time he has to continue on the insulin. So we have to find out the strategies and the proper ways by which we can continue the patient on insulin, keeping him happy and comfortable. So that is what I'm going to talk about today. So this is my financial disclosure. As we all know, this is a no one audit sponsored session. And most of the slides have actually been provided by them. Now, I will try to divide my session into three parts. And this is the agenda of today's talk. That first of all, we'll talk about taking into account the clinical considerations. And then I'll introduce a couple of cases. And finally, I will end up with the right durable device for long-term insulin care. But again, this device chapter has been taken well care of by Dr. Mitun Bhatia, so I don't need to waste much time on that. So basically, how do we define the insulin therapy? Basically, this is the protocol of insulin therapy. We start on initiate the way Sambit has taught us. Then we optimize, we dose titrate to ensure the patient receives the maximum benefit from the prescribed treatment. And this basically means that you up titrate or down titrate the dose of the insulin. But even after doing that, you may find that the glycemic control is not well maintained. A good example of that is initiating a patient on a basal insulin. With the basal insulin, you get the fasting plasma glucose control pretty fast. But the postprandial glucose may not be well controlled just with the basal insulin. And that is where the need for intensification of the treatment, which means modification of an insulin regimen, that is adding or changing the therapy to maintain the glycemic control. So from a basal insulin, we can move on to what is known as either a premixed insulin or maybe a basal bolus regimen. So these are the two options of intensification of insulin therapy. Now, why this continued insulin treatment should be there, I think we all know about it. So initially, the diabetes management as a beta cell function is not too bad. Uh, we manage with lifestyle and ovaries. But we have to bear in mind the simple fact that by the time diabetes is diagnosed, 50% of the beta cells are dysfunctional. It does not mean they're dead. They're simply not working. So what happens is that after that, we initiate either on the premix or the basal insulin along with the OADs. But if it doesn't work with this intensification, with, uh, then we have to go for a premix or a basal plus four bolus. And this is what is known as an intensification of the insulin regimen. And intensification, let me assure friends, it is a part and parcel of the management of chronic diabetes care. Now, why is that so? Because prandial excursions are evident in all individuals with type 2 diabetes. Fasting gets controlled first, but after that, the bis biggest difficulty comes in controlling the postprandial glucose. So what happens most of the time is that the blood glucose, which is elevated, it requests additional treatment to get it down to the normal levels. So in order to do that, there are several options. We can go with the subnuria, which will act as a beta cell stimulator. But again, in a long-standing diabetes, the beta cell stimulators, they do not act as well. So we have to add something like a bolus insulin, and just to make the job simpler for the patient, we might switch over to a premix insulin, which will take care of both fasting and the post meal glucose. Now, why is post meal hyperglycemia that important? 25 years from today, way back in 1996, Dr. Mohan came up with this wonderful study lasting over 25 years, where he looked at the vascular complication of long term type 2 diabetes. Remember, type 2 diabetes at the time was known as NIDDM. The nomenclature has changed uh, from this millennium. <clears throat> so basically what they found out that a variable postprandial glucose led to nearly 2.74 times increased risk of nephropathy and nearly two times increased risk of neuropathy. And what is very important was that this postprandial hyperglycemia was associated with this increased risk of nephro, neuro and retinopathy. Also the retinopathy was significantly increased all these three microvascular complications were significantly altered by an increased postprandial glucose. Now, we all know that microvascular complications are basically results of just poor glycemic control. So, obviously, it goes without saying that if the fasting and the postprandial glucose, we can both get them under control, then obviously the risks of the microvascular complications will be significantly minimized. <clears throat> 
Now, what are the associations that we have noticed over the years? The postprandial hyperglycemia, it is a better predictor for subsequent myocardial infarction and cardiovascular mortality than fasting hyperglycemia. This is something that we all know from uh, the several studies which have been done, like the Arab studies and others. But they're the better predictors of all cause death than fasting plasma glucose. They're more strongly associated with carotid intermediate thickness than fasting plasma glucose, the HB1C, because we all know that increased insulin resistance is one of the contributors to increased atherosclerosis and can worsen this uh, intravascular atherosclerosis. And what is also more important is that post postprandial hyperglycemia correlates more accurately with HB1C value or its contribution over hyperglycemia better than the fasting glucose. We have seen that, particularly in Indian patients, this is very important. Forget the Monia slide where there was actually a discrepancy between the contribution of uh, individual fasting and postprandial glucose in patients with uh, uh, elevated HB1C. In Indian patients, and this came basically from a Chinese study, uh, patients all across Asia, at any level of HB1C, there is a higher contribution from postprandial glucose than from fasting plasma glucose. So obviously, the question comes, why is the insulin intensification delayed? There are several re reasons for that. Uh, one reason is the inflexible regimens. The patients find it difficult to stick on to an inflexible regimen where you tell the patient that you must have this regimen at this time of the day. You must take it half an hour before the meal. This is what happens with conventional insulin. And if that comes with the associated risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain, this further contributes to the patient in our show. And what is very important is that our complex treatment regimen, where you have to take different doses of insulin at different times of the day, further makes it difficult for the patient to follow our proper treatment barrier, treatment regimen. And these are the significant barriers to the onset of a proper intensification regimen. Clinical inertia has what several things, as this particular South Korean study will show. What we can see here, this was a South Korean study which looked at the patient perspective as well as the physician perspective. And you can see around 51.6% of the patients said that insulin, uh, the inconvenience of the insulin regimen was the primary reason. So more than 50, for more than 50% of patients, this was the biggest reason. And fear of injection came next in around 48% of patients. Now, insulin is obviously still now something which we cannot give orally because of uh, the breakdown when it, the insulin as a polypeptide passes through the gastric uh, mucosal barrier. So that is something which we cannot avoid. So insulin always has to be given in, a, in, a, in an injection form. But this inconvenience is something which we can overcome by giving better insulin regimens. And there is this prevalent misconception, none the more in India, that insulin is the end of the life. So once you take it, your day is a number. So these are prevalent misconceptions. And what are the patient's uh, physician's perspective? This is something which we all agree. At least one third of our patients simply refuse and another 1% patients that simply lack the will. And if it's a complex regime, there is a, an issue regarding the patient's compliance. There are concerns about the hypoglycemia. And the patient feels that, okay, I can just apply to the dose of the tablet so I can avoid the insulin. And this is one of the perspectives which we find very much in India. Both this study was a South Korean study. What they found out was uh, the reasons they found out are equally applicable for the Indian patients. Indian patients, they have do not have the proper diabetes knowledge. And this is something. What Shombit also touched in his talk, the patient education has to go hand in hand with both the insulin initiation and the intensification because the patient has to know exactly what he is doing and why he is doing that because otherwise the entire purpose will be lost. So with that, I'll move on to a couple of case-based discussions which will help in elucidating this particular uh, thing that I'm trying to present here. So this is the ADA 2021 guidelines. Basically, it suggests that if the age builds is above target following a basal insulin, there are three options. You can go for a GLP-1 receptor analog. But again, in an Indian scenario, that is difficult because primarily because of the cost factor. So that leaves us with the two options. One is uh, going on to a twice daily NPH regimen, or the other one is to add a prandial insulin. Now, what they have suggested is you start prandial insulin in a dose of four units a day or 10% of the basal insulin dose. Now, if the HB1C is less than 8%, then consider lowering the basal dose by 4 units or a dose or to around 10% of the basal dose. So you titrate, up titrate. This is something which was again shown very well by Shomit in his presentation. Increase the dose by 1 to 2 weeks around twice weekly. 
And if there is a presence of hypoglycemia, you reduce the pre-hypoglycemia dose by around 10 to 20 percent. Now, even after additional the basal prandial insulin, if you need, still need to opt titrate, you have to go for a stepwise opt titration of the insulin pattern, and you progress to a full basal bolus regimen. That is one thing in whom basal bolus regimen is something which again is advocated for people with gross glycemic variabilities. But again, if that is not present, we can go on to a twice daily premix insulin. And this, this is basically one of the insulin regimens of convenience. So with this sort of a background, let us look at this first case. So there's a 55-year-old gentleman, a teacher, who has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in 2010. And he had a good control with metformin for two years. His age was a drop from 8.3 to 7.3 when citagliptin was added. But subsequently, his control started iterating. So just have a look. In just four years' time, the control started iterating even with the medicines. And this is something which is very commonly seen in Indian patients. Within four to six years after the initiation of the anti-diabetic therapy, often it so happens that the glycemic control stops in the area. And this is primarily because of the progressive beta cell dysfunction. So this patient was started on an insulin plasmid once daily. His initial hba one c went down to 7.1 and graduated it went back to 7.8. And the glycemic dose was increased farther due to one, uh, around 32 units with worsening glycemic control. Now, what happened because of that, the patient was getting recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia during the night time. He was losing, as he was a teacher, he was losing the confidence of teaching in the class because he was always afraid of hypoglycemia. And he lowered his total daily insulin to avoid the hypos. So the net result was that the incidence of hypoglycemia was reduced, but the HB also went up to 9. And the post prandial glucose was 230. So obviously, the question that we need to answer here should he accept the situation with a poorly controlled glycemic hb one That means, should he settle with an hb one of 9? Should we renew his education and find out what exactly is wrong with his insulin injection treatment? Should we check onto a premix insulin twice daily? Should we change it to basal plus regimen or any other options like add any other agents like ADPP for any better or salts, as yield to any better and so on and so forth? So obviously, all these are possible, but you have to look at the best possible outcome-based evidence. So what was did in this patient? This patient was switched over to insulin bias 30 twice daily in addition to metformin. The patient was given the diabetes and insulin education and it was ensured that the insulin dose was upgraded in such a way that there were no deterring hypoglycemia events. The patient was specifically asked to avoid the snacking and he could manage to do that because he was not getting any hypoglycemia. And the HB1C with this treatment in around three months' time, it reduced to 7.4. And the patient returned uh, back to his classroom teaching profession with more confidence. Now, what is the evidence that we're looking at for that? Now, BIAS-30 has shown a robust hb one reduction across the randomized control trials and observation studies, as this particular slide will show. There is a substantial drop of between 1.2 to 1.5 percent across the board. So this is very, very important. Somebody whose hb one has gone up to 9%, even if you can get it bound by 1.5%, it drops down to 75 So this is very, very heartening. And this happens over a period of around four to six months. Now, if you look at the individual fasting and the post-meal glucose components, we can see this is, again, a meta-analysis of three studies, not a huge uh, meta-analysis. But again, if you look at the degree of heterogeneity here, there was a significant heterogeneity. So apart from one study done by Leiter et al. in 2011, the two other studies, they basically showed absolutely no difference in the fasting plasma glucose control compared with insulin glargin. Having said that, insulin glargin definitely has got a significant role in obtaining a good satisfactory fasting plasma glucose. But again, if you look at the postprandial glucose, it is far, far inferior to bias 30. And that's no wonder for that because uh, insulin glargin does not have any prandial component. So no wonder here is that the addition of a bias 30 showed a significant around 14.7% uh, improvement in the postprandial glucose control in comparison to insulin glargin 200. And if you look at the risk of hypoglycemia, the risk of severe risk of hypoglycemia was lower with bias 30 than with insulin glargin. And if you remember, in these trials, the heterogeneity of the studies was very minimal when we looked at the severe hypoglycemia angle. 
With that, let us move on to the second case. This is a 57-year-old male who was present, uh, was working as an architect and had a 12-year history of diabetes. So he had a diabetes much longer than the first gentleman. And metformin was started after diagnosis with subsequent addition of glycoside. Insulin glargine was started uh, with metformin to achieve the glycemic control again here. The glargine was titrated when he underwent an abdominal surgery and he was put on a basal glucose therapy. He was on glargine 32 and a regular insulin of 10, 8 and 10. Now what happened? He was having frequent daytime hypoglycemia. He started defensive snacking and this led to an increase in the weight gain. And he periodically lowered the total daily insulin because of the sphere of hypoglycemia. What the net result was that his glycemic control went haywire. His HB once went up to 8.5, fasting of 184, and postprandial of 220. Now, obviously, with this condition, this intensification of insulin therapy has to take into account two factors. First of all, it's a long standing type 2 diabetes, where the addition of a sulfonuria may not contribute much in improving the postprandial glucose because the beta cells are already gone into a decay or maybe into a death mode. Whereas when it comes to the hypoglycemia, obviously the sort of insulin regimen was inadequate to protect him from hypoglycemia. So obviously the option was, do we shift this patient onto a premix analog twice daily? Should we shift onto an analog basal bolus regimen or shift on to a more convenient IDEG as twice daily? So with this answer, let us look at the differences between the basal bolus and the premix regimens. So the basal bolus, obviously, it's the most physiological regimen, but again, it is the most complex regimen. It offers the potential flexibility in terms of diet and activity. So if the patient takes an excess diet one day, the patient has what liberty to increase the dose of the insulin, which is not there with the premix basal bolus regimen. But here, the patient has basically got to have a better lifestyle choice, and he must know how to take the insulin at different times of the day. So basically, a basal bolus gives a better metabolic control, offers a potential for the best control of basal and postprandial hyperglycemia. But this comes at a cost of multiple insulin injections. It's a more complicated to support, and the patient's level of education has to be really great if he has to be taught all the nitty gritties of a basal bolus regimen. He has to be taught about the carb counts. He has to talk about what happens if he does more exercise and he suddenly ends up with a blood glucose drop. He has to be taught about his problems of hypoglycemia and weight gain. And he needs a full patient motivation and regular monitoring, something which unfortunately is not present in the majority of our Indian type 2 diabetes patients. So what we did with this patient was that along with metformin, this patient was started on insulin degradation. As I take gas, 32 units equally divided into two units, 16 and 16. And I take gas was titrated with 18 to 20. And at the end of the four weeks, we can see here the post prandial glucose dropped significantly to 170. There is some noise in the background. RX events, can you look at it? There is some noise in the background. I, 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 yeah. Right, okay. So what happened was this, after this, this, this is where the uh, role of intensification comes. The first... Twelve weeks, this patient had this treatment regimen continued for eight to twelve weeks. There was no hypoglycemia. The patient had a better compliance, and the fasting dropped even further to 108. HbA1c down to 7.1. Now let us make one point very clear: what most of the studies have shown that if you can get the HbA1c down to seven or around that region, you can present prevent most of the micro and macrovascular complications. You don't need to get it too tied down to 6.5 because as we have seen in the UKPDA studies that the microvascular complications start happening after the HB1C is above 7. If you can keep it just at 7, maybe a little below, you can prevent all these complications from happening. So in this gentleman, you can see your this patient's glycemic profile is there before you and you can see how in 12 weeks time, his fasting plasma glucose came down from 184 to 108. The post-breakfast glucose came down from 220 to 120. 
And the HBO also came down from 8.5 to 7.1. There was obviously some weight gain which happens with any degree of glycemic control when you're taking the treatment therapy. But this weight gain was very minimal, just 2 kgs in the span of 12 weeks, which is nothing. And if the patient is active enough, he can actually overcome that by doing more brisk exercise and having a better control of his diet. Now, this is uh, again some evidence of uh, IDEG as in comparison to a basal bolus regimen of insulin glargine versus IAS plus OADs. So, this was a study, the inclusion criteria was type 2 diabetes more than 18 years. So, patients had been treated with basal insulin for more than 90 days prior to the screening, plus OADs for at least 90 days. And this excluded the thiazolid in Dion's. HB on at the time of inclusion was between 7 and 10. Patients randomized one is to one to get either IDEG as once daily plus OADs or insulin glargine 200 once daily plus as per once daily or OADs. And then gradually after 26 weeks, these patients were further uptitrated into once daily or twice daily IDEG as or uh, uptitrated into IAS once, twice or thrice daily in addition to oral condition, oral uh, anti diabetic agents. It was an open level study. And subjects on IDEGAS not reaching target, they were intensified. Well, those on insulin glargine arm, they're also intensified, as I've shown. So, what you was seen here that with both this IDEGAS twice daily, uh, and whereas the, compared to the basal bolus regimen, there was a similar degree of HB1 reduction. Both in both these arms, HB1 dropped to below 7%. Now, as I mentioned already, if you can get 8 to 0, 7, it doesn't really matter with 6.88 or 6.92. Yes, obviously with the basal bolus, there was some degree of numerical better uh, reduction of HbA1c, but this was not statistically significant. And if you look at it, because the total insulin dose requirement also went down substantially in the IDEG as price daily regimen. In around 26 weeks times, there was a 12% reduction of the insulin dosage. And when the study was concluded at 38 weeks, Overall, there was a 9% reduction of the total daily insulin dose. This is something which also helps the patient in the long run to achieve a glycemic control at a cheaper cost. And if you look at the overall incidence of hypoglycemia, again at 26%, there was with IDEG as there was a 19%, uh, sorry, there was a 10% reduction of hypoglycemia. At 38 weeks, altogether a 14% reduction of hypoglycemia. Nocturnal hypoglycemia was reduced by as much as 45% at 26 weeks and around 39% at 38 weeks. Now, we all know that this 14% numerically risk of overall hypoglycemia and 39% overall risk or reduction of nocturnal hypoglycemia is very, very significant. Why particularly nocturnal hypoglycemia? Because we all know that the patient is maximum vulnerable when he's sleeping. And if he gets a hypoglycemia in the middle of his sleep, he just cannot protect himself. So that's the reason any insulin which reduces the nocturnal hypoglycemia will be an insulin of choice in this sort of a patient. So IDEG ASP basically offers a simple and effective step-by-step -step approach from initiation to intensification. So you can start with the OADs, you can go on from the basal insulin to an IAS, and you can then you can go on to IDEG ASP. Right, we have exceeded five minutes. Kindly uh, I'm just, okay. just, just a couple of minutes more. So uh, basically, this is, and you can give a similar result with an IDEG as twice daily. So the last thing is about the device about which Nikon has already talked about. So I'm not going to take more than a few seconds about it. Just a study which showed that Novo Print 4 was accurate for long term use, even after five simulated years of use. So, with that, the summary of my presentation today is that the overall aim when we're talking about the intensification to achieve a glucose levels as close to normal as possible. Now, as glycemic control deteriorates over time, you have to continue the insulin treatment. Intensifying with a premix insulin or a core formulation like IDEG ASP provides effective glycemic control in a simple manner as compared to the basal bolus therapy with a much reduced risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain. And the continuation of treatment with insulin as guided by the clinical scenario helps in minimizing the long-term micro and macrovascular complications of diabetes. So when we're talking about a long-term control of diabetes, a continuation of insulin does help considerably. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much and sorry for the hiccups.